Welcome everyone. This is our last lecture in computer vision. Today I'm going to show you pixel RNNs and contrastive predictive coding. CPC and pixel RNNs are concluding uh, the self-supervised learning block um, and they're concluding the entire class. Um, self-supervised learning uh, is becoming more and more important uh, in computer vision, um, especially in domains where you only have little data or really complex labeling tasks. So, um, you know, reviewing our different um, tasks, uh, we we looked at so classification, object detection, and segmentation. Um, you know, while for uh, the former tasks, so image classification, for example, it's pretty easy to obtain labels, right? So one image takes uh, maybe half a second for um, for a human, or maybe a second, to um, detect or to identify what's on the image, uh, and maybe a little, a couple more seconds to put that into your interface. The more complex these tasks get, um, like for example, pixel level uh, scene segmentation or semantic segmentation tasks, the the more complex these tasks get. Um, the more time consuming the labeling task also gets. Yeah? So for example, uh, creating such a uh, semantic segmentation um, map for a complex uh, scene with many, many, many objects in there, um, this could easily take half an hour, for example, per sample. And the more complex these tasks are, the more um, um, samples you actually need, right? So for the model to learn this mapping, um, which in the end leads to the question, okay, how can we even uh, train a model when we're missing uh, labels um, or data? Yeah? So think of also some tasks that just don't come with a lot of data. So from, for example, medical um, imaging tasks where labels come from experts that you know, just don't have the time uh, to sit you know, on a computer and label images. Um, so in self-supervised learning, we now try to use the raw data samples that we are given, no additional um, you know, labels, to um, learn to represent the underlying structure in the data. So one of the many different ways uh, we can approach this um, is like this. So think of an input image and one part of the image is erased and the model now has to learn to fill in this blank space. So, you know, I mean, we as humans, you know, looking at that image, we kind of have a mental image of how this would continue, right? And so the model has to kind of detect or identify what is in the image and then has to also learn image structures that kind of fit to this observation in the first half. Huh? And uh, you will see many different kinds of approaches. So for example, we could leave out like this checkerboard of, of, of image patches. Um, so for, for example, you can use this uh, to learn a model that does uh, super resolution, but whatever the end task is, the, the model really has to learn how different uh, structures that it sees relate to each other, right? Uh, so spatially. And of course, our data often has a temporal dimension. So, so for example, audio data or uh, even other uh, sequential data uh, could be thought of, you know, living in time. Um, so in computer vision, for example, we have um, um, videos, yeah? And one, you know, fundamental approach here is that we can predict the future from um, the historical context uh, here shown in, in dark blue. Yeah? So it goes without saying that self-supervised learning isn't limited to computer vision. Uh, when you think back to the RNN lecture, uh, we've already seen um, how to learn a language model by predicting the, the next word, consecutive words uh, in a sequence. Yeah? So now how can we use self-supervised learning in practice? So a common approach is to 
um, first train a model like we saw, right? So from the first half of an image, predict the second half. And then once this is trained in an unsupervised or a self-supervised way, we then um, extract um, in an internal representation, um, you know, the activations of a certain uh, later layer um, to represent the input. And then we train a classifier that predicts, for example, for an image classification task, the label uh, in, a, in a supervised way. No? And so, um, the you know the, the task that you train this classifier or this regressor on is pretty arbitrary here but uh, we use image classification as, as an example now um, the cool thing and the impressive thing is that uh, one you can reach the same performance levels with with much fewer data points so uh, and we'll look at at this figure uh, later on in, in the lecture um, so you need so for example the blue line right is um the performance of a classifier that was trained in this kind of fashion here uh by, by using pre-trained um, cpc representations you to reach the same kind of performance you need f you know much fewer labels so factor five to two depending on where you are in, the, in your performance level and Secondly, if you used all available data to train your classifier, uh, you will outperform a purely supervised learned model. So this is really cool, and this gives you an edge um, in problems in uh, which you do have, you know, too little data, or even in problems that uh, you know are fully equipped with with a lot of data. So today we look at two algorithms in self-supervised learning one is called uh, pixel rn which actually isn't one model it's uh it's, it's i think four different uh formulations in that paper and this method was introduced um six years ago by google SteepMind. and then the second method is called contrastive predictive coding uh or cpc in short um and that was like I think proposed two years later, yeah, two years later in 2018. And I think it's still a very clever and, and uh, a very powerful method that was um, adopted and um, adapted many times by uh, the community. And both papers are uh, first authored by um, Aaron Vandenort. Uh, so this lecture is like uh, a Vandenort tribute video of some sorts. No? Okay, so let's think back for a minute um, to the way RNNs can be used to model uh, sequences or sentences. So here the model represents the, the history of inputs um, in a hidden state variable and spits out a distribution over uh, our vocabulary. So we would start the generation process with a start token and we'd create a distribution from which we sample words and then we put in these words to sample subsequent words, right? Um, until we, in the end, sample a stop token and then that's our sentence. Yeah? And this could um, easily be adapt uh, uh, adapted to the image domain, right? So, because images can be seen as sequences of um, pixel values and, um, you know, we could start this generation process by the same start token, generate a distribution over pixel brightness values, sample from this distribution, uh, obtain um, our first pixel, put this back in, and together with the historical context, we would then produce a, a different distribution, right? Sharing all parameters, but the context really, the uh, history of pixels that we generated, um, kind of makes up that the change that we need in this distribution. And we hope that the model is powerful enough to actually, uh, you know, create these, um, distributions um, um, that, that that when we sample from them in the sequential manner produce images that look uh, like naturally uh, or nat natural images huh? and that idea is the underlying idea in, in pixel RNNs so so let's say we um, we would like to model the probability of all possible images 
And uh, so you can imagine this to, you know, be such a distribution over all pic pixel dimensions, right? So for a thousand pixel uh, by a thousand pixel, so one megapixel uh, image is like a one million dimensional space in which we have such a distribution, yeah? So for certain combinations of pixel values, of pixel brightnesses, let's just think of uh, gray value um, images here. You know, for some regions, for some combinations, there should be more probability mass than for other regions, right? So think of one class of, of images like faces or, or dogs or whatever, um, you know, what makes up a, you know, a dog or a face is a certain combination, a certain relation between bright pixels and dark pixels, right? So we want to have a model that given a valid, um, image produces an output set uh, that says, yeah, that's very likely. That's, that's a dog. That's a face. Yeah. Now, but modeling this distribution directly over all um, uh, pixels, so over all pixel dimensions, uh, isn't possible because su such a big space is called, you know, we, we say it's intractable. But what we can do um, to model P of X is uh, through a chain of conditional probabilities, just like we saw uh, on, on one of those previous slides. So we we, we say, okay, the probability of a, of a given image X is the product of those conditional probabilities of the probability of a given pixel value at position I given all previous um, pixel values. Yeah? And so we want to maximize the likelihood of the training data under this density um, and that is tractable, and that is what uh, the pixel RNN authors uh, propose. Yeah, and um, so that's different from what GANs do, right? So remember GANs, we um, have a generator that we feed in a normally distributed random variable or a uniformly distributed random variable, and then we map to an output, and that is not a probability; that is an actual sample. Yeah, so we indirectly, implicitly um, model this distribution, uh, but we, we, so sampling many, many Z's, we can generate many, many um, X's, right? So many, many uh, Im images, but not a distribution of probabilities uh, like we want to do here. So how would this approach look like for images? Just similar to the mechanism on, on the previous slide, the RNN would be fed uh, pixel by pixel uh, to produce a distribution from which we sample the value of a new pixel. Yeah? And the context here in, in blue um, would grow gradually until we generated the last pixel. Yeah? Um, the parameters of the model would be shared. Um, that means that whatever pixel we want to generate mm, the same model would be responsible, right? So if we want to generate the first pixel with no context, that would use the same parameters like generating the last uh, pixel with uh, with the almost you know uh, entire context. Um, so now think of how simplistic, uh, let's say this this uh, approach is, but also how hard it is for the model to do that, yeah. Um, and also think about how hard it is to parallelize this. You can, right? So this approach is basically saying you have to um, generate an image pixel by pixel. You can parallelize that. And that's why it's not used in practice at all. And that is the start of the, of the pixel RNN paper. So to understand the, the pixel RNN uh, paper and the pixel RNNs as a method, you have to be introduced to so-called multi dimensional and in our, in our image case, two dimensional LSTMs. Uh, a type of LSTM that was uh, proposed a while ago in 2008 by Alex Graves and uh, um, Jürgen Schmidt, who but Alex uh, now works with DeepMind and uh, you know did a PhD with, with Jürgen Schmidt Huber uh, back in the days. And they introduced LSTMs that mm, would represent and also have access to two-dimensional hidden states. So um, for hidden states, um, so, so, sorry, for, for generating an image, 
we would feed in, like we did, uh, the current pixel at position ij, but now the RNN would use the hidden state from the previous pixel in the same row, but also um, the pixel above, like uh, uh, one row above, yeah? Um, so the LSTM then so you know doesn't linearize uh, linearize the, the the picture right it would still have access to like the context and then would generate a prediction of mm, a pixel value for the next position which then you know could be compared in the self-supervised kind of manner um, to then create a loss and then we could optimize this whole um, the sole RNN. These people in that paper do, didn't use it like that, but you know it could be, and that's why um, the fixed RNN authors mentioned that paper. But since this again is um, or it can only be used in a sequential manner, the pixel RNN authors now propose different kinds of improvement to this idea. One of which I will present here, uh, which is called the row LSTM, and that's. Um, I think the most, the simplest implementation um, of pixel RNNs, and let's review real quick uh, its architecture. So we start with a seven by seven convolution of the input image, and we we think of this as a grayscale image. Um, the the authors explain how this can be done for for color images, but uh, I think to keep it simple, uh, we should stay in 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 one channel images. So. Use a one, uh, sorry, uh, seven by seven convolution to create a feature map, and that feature map has depth h. Yeah? So this is the internal uh, dimensionality for our RNN that we'll uh, introduce in a second, and then we'll use another conf layer on this representation, but we'll only operate on the row dimension. Yeah. And that convolution produces a variable that we call QI, right? So I is again an image location. So we have a whole bunch of them um, generated with two, two layers of convolution. Yeah? So this line here has dimensionality of H, that's the depth, N, that's the number of um, um, columns in one row, okay? Now, this feature map, or rather the, the one above, which in the first line doesn't exist yet, but I just showed here uh, uh, one above, this one is again convolved with another kernel, KSS, which maps um, the hidden state to the next hidden state, to the next time point or next lines uh, hidden state. So we have two variables, QI and QS. Um, which which are the result from those two uh, convolutions. And remember, LSTMs um, employ um, so-called gates that are dot-wise multiplied to um, different things like inputs or hidden states. And so these two variables, QS and QI, are then used to create these gate values, which are then like in these equations, um, used to obtain the hidden state hi, so bold h, not, not the h that we used here, um, and bold ci, so context and hidden state vectors for each image location i. Now, this creates a full line of state variables. So for each um, image location, um, we obtain one you know, RNN state, let's say, but that can be done um, fully parallelizable in one step. Yeah? And we can then, having obtained that, that first layer here, that, that first line, we can then run the RNN uh, line by line, can continue until the last line, until we have the screen block that is now representing all state variables, the hidden and the context vectors, for all pixel locations in the image. Then 
as the last step, we use a one by one convolution to map that, um, you know, for each image location to a 256 dimensional output, which is our uh, pixel brightness distribution from which we want to sample. And, and actually, I think the the paper used um, two layers of, of convolutions, but, you know, for the sake of simplicity, we, we just uh, say we have one here. Yeah. So our output is the pixel distribution from which we want to then sample. But now in inference, generating an image, we have to sample um, these pixel values for each line first before we go down here, right? Because uh, uh, those those input pixels don't yet exist. Okay, so that that means we still have to um, have a sequential um, generation process. But um, you know, we have we, we we do this only for lines now, not for pixels. We do this uh, line by line, which speeds up the process. And um, Now in training, um, we have to be very cautious because remember the first step that we did uh, was this convolution, the seven by seven convolution, creating representations that would then serve later to predict pixels. Yeah? So using a normal uh, convolution, like for example, this five by five here, um, this would leak information about later pixels into that representation. Yeah? And in inference, even there will be no future pixels that can we that, that can be used to leak information from. So in training, we need to make sure that we uh, use not the normal convolution. We mask out future pixels. So to um, create an output for that orange pixel location in that in that convolution, we cannot use um that very location because that would leak information about the pixel we want to generate but also about the future pixels here in gray we can only use information here encoded uh, or uh, color coded in blue so when trained on ImageNet, we can now generate uh images like that i think this is uh, a subsampled version of ImageNet. They kind of look really realistic. They uh, kind of show natural scenes, but if you really look close, uh, I mean, I, at least I have the feeling that, uh, you know, sometimes you can make sense of them. There is nothing really I, I can identify, but uh, I think that the image structures uh, look natural. Um, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's because the, the resolution is too low. We can't. Uh, we can't um, identify any objects in there. Um, but, you know, as we discussed in the beginning, we can use the model now to complete um, image halves, like, like we see here. Right? So we start uh, putting this in, and then we generate line by line um, the rest of the image, and comparing to the original, um, that kind of uh, often really makes sense. Now, with Pixel RNNs is our first self-supervised model and vision in mind. Let's uh, move on and look at uh, contrastive predictive coding CPC. To understand CPC, we have to understand uh, these three terms, right? So contrastive, predictive, and coding. And what these mean, uh, let's discuss in the last couple of minutes. So the method can be explained by looking at that one figure that they have in the paper. Um, and we start with um, an example, um, which is a one-dimensional function in time. So let's say that we have this audio signal. And so we first tokenize uh, the input into like subsequences of this audio file. And then, right, so they have all uh, the same length and we can use a um, encoder function, genc here, that translate um, each of these uh, input subsequences into an internal representation that we call Z for each time step. Yeah, so G N is um, you know probably a confnet, uh, N is always the same for each of these time steps and produces um, you know these blue boxes here. Okay, so in the second part then we um, have a so-called autoregressive model 
auto means self, so it regresses on itself. Um, and this is mostly an, uh, a recurrent network, so an RNN that kind of uh, contains the history of inputs and produces a so-called context vector, C at t, a time point t, from which we predict linearly back into the internal state space uh, for the next time point. And we'll use linear projections. Um, we use uh, the notation of W, so uh, capital Ws are weight matrices. Um, and each step has their own weight matrix, so their own linear projections. Um, so, you know, predicting one step ahead or two steps ahead or four steps ahead always gets a um, unique and uh, individual matrix. But these, you know, step, step projections, these, these predictions um, have to be valid over the entire data set. Um, and so, you know, you can think of this as uh, to be possible because we already have a, a highly nonlinear function with this confnet and then this RNN so that when you know and that's you know mostly the case when that function the input function is more or less smooth it should be should be possible to predict linearly the next couple of times right so not not too far in the in the future but it should um, we hope it should be possible now um, these projections uh, will be optimized uh, according to a loss function that we will uh, explain a little later. Um, so we will optimize uh, those projections and also the autoregressive model and the encoder um, according to a loss function that looks at how similar those predicted z's are to the actual z's, right? So this is comparing like in the self-supervised fashion, um, whatever we have in the future and what our, in, uh, what our uh, predictive model says, right? So that covers predictive encoding, right? So the, that's, the, that's the coding and that's the predictions. Now, so before we look at the contrastive, uh, part in this uh, in this whole scheme. Let's review uh, real quick how we can apply this idea to images. So um, we first take 64 pixels by 64 pixel uh, patches, image patches, and embed them with a confident uh, into our z vectors. And these patches uh, overlap um, half of width and height. Um, and then so yeah, right. So these so neighboring um, z vectors kind of represent patches that share um, information, that they share structures. Now, the autoregressive model now sees only these blue um, encoded image patches and predicts <clears throat> a number of pixels below that position, right? So from that pixel position, we predict <clears throat> two lines, the same row, uh, sorry, the same column, but, but two rows below, three rows below, and so on. Hmm? <coughs> so I think they don't predict the pixel uh, in, this, in the next row because of the overlap and because of the, the information leakage. Not sure about that. So why is this called contrastive predictive coding? So um, think about the whole architecture again. So the model tries to predict internal representations of the input for future elements using a model of the history and the only information we use is the is the uh, temporal or spatial neighborhood right so we can think of both the encoder and the autoregressive model as feature extractors and they will learn to extract those features that um, enable this those linear mappings to predict the step well the next steps well <clears throat> and <clears throat> but how can we improve these features um, without any additional labels. So the authors propose using the image identity, right? So we know that uh, some patches originate from the same image and we could use other patches that are from, from, from different images. So um, the model should therefore not only be predicting 
the next image patch or audio subsequence? Well, um, that belongs to the same, let's call it positive sample. The models should at the same time predict um, our, our internal representations of these patches or, or audio subsequences um, such that they are maximally different <clears throat> from patches that are, you know, taken from uh, other samples, from negative, so-called negative samples. Yeah? So mm, let's collect n many samples, and one of them is the same, uh, is, a, is a patch from the same um, from, from, from the same image or from the same audio file. N minus one samples are from other samples. And so the loss function LN now is minimal if we maximize this expression, which basically is exactly what I said. So FK is the dot product between the projected context. So that's our Z tilde, uh, the dot product with the actual uh, internal uh, representation zi so that that should be maximized and then we minimize this one in, in um, down, down, down below here so that's the sum over all negative examples of that dot product right so we want that that are yeah that are um, linear projections and our autoregressive model and our encoder all you know produce dot products that are uh, maximum or uh, maximal so they're as similar as possible when our comparison originates from the same sample and should be orthogonal or you know as small as possible um, uh, even negative right so even pointing in the opposite direction um, for samples that originate from, uh, or for, for patches that originate from other samples. Okay. Now, if you train CPC um, on ImageNet, for example, and then use the Z-space, so, so the internal representation, to cluster image patches, you get something that actually actually really makes sense. So, uh, for example, all you know these. Faces uh, are clustered together with a couple of, um, you know, <clears throat> exceptions where we don't see any face, or you know, all those car tires or uh, keyboard, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, buttons. So that kind, of, that, that that model, although it has never seen any label except, you know, internal patches or, you know, implicitly because they are taken from the same or from other uh, images, um, it kind of generates meaningful representations. And so now the cool thing is that if you use CPC representations and you train a supervised classifier, not using any images anymore, but using these representations of the image uh, to like predict the image, uh, the, the, the class, right? The class of the image, you get really competitive results. So this these tables, are, you know, compared to other self-supervised um, methods so but really the best thing is and that i had mentioned earlier you don't need as much training data to actually achieve the same performance as uh, supervised uh, purely supervised uh, models um, and if you if you used all your data you can even outperform uh, purely supervised models and another cool thing is that um, the CPC representations really, uh, you know, transfer well. So the authors like used a, uh, it's called CPC V2. So that's like a improvement of the original CPC idea um, and trained this CPC version two on ImageNet and then used these representations or the, the model to um, obtain image representations on um, another data set on Pascal Wok and then trained an, an object detection network. Uh, so a, a different task even, and outperform all the, the competition. So that's really, um, uh, that had a lot of impact uh, in the community. So, and since then CPC has been used in a wide variety of, of domains, not just image uh, or computer vision, and performs really well. So it can be seen as 
you know, a generic off-the-shelf self-supervised learning uh, technique that I think you must know, and that's why it sh it shows up here. I think you should read um, the paper and also the this paper that then followed up. Uh, I think two years later, even, and um, yeah, and then you're fully equipped with um, computer vision knowledge. Okay, so that was the lecture on self-supervised learning, but that was also the entire class in the winter term. So I hope you enjoyed uh, what we had for you. Um, if you um, want to comment, please leave one below. Uh, you know, if you want us to cover specific topics in the next term, or if you think we made a mistake, please, please let us know. Uh, don't forget, there will be an unsupervised learning lecture in the next winter term. So stay healthy, stay peaceful. Goodbye.